Good evening, and welcome to the Mid-Manhattan Library. Tonight's program is an illustrated talk based on the book titled, The Muslims Are Coming, Islamophobia, Extremism, and the Domestic War on Terror by Dr. Arun Kunani. I'd like, to, I'd like to ask you at this time if your cell phone is on to please turn it off, and please do not take any pictures during the presentation. This from the introduction of Mr. Kugnani's book, quote, the government, U.S., was no longer imagining the threat as foreign terrorist sleepers living among ordinary American Muslims. Now it was the radicalization of ordinary American Muslims themselves that it feared, unquote. In support of this statement, I want to tell you about a podcast that I heard a couple weeks ago on the Rachel Maddow show. I don't know if you've heard of her, but she's a um, she has she's a political talk show host, and she has a program on uh, MSNBC. She opened her program with a story how the FBI had just distributed a photo to the public of a mass terrorist with, and this is important, a native North American accent. The FBI was helping the public's help in identifying him. And when I heard that story, it uh, reminded me of your talk tonight. Uh, it is now ordinary Americans that the FBI say that we should fear. According to reviews, the Muslims are coming, Islamophobia, extremism, and the domestic war on terror is the most comprehensive study yet on how governments fight terrorism on both sides of the Atlantic. Dr. Kundanani took several years to research his latest book. He interviewed FBI agents working on counterterrorism and accused Muslim extremists. He holds a PhD from London Metropolitan University and an undergraduate degree from Cambridge University in Cambridge, England. He is an adjunct professor of media, culture, and communication at New York University, teaches terrorism studies at John Jay College, and has been a visiting fellow at Leiden University in the Netherlands, an open society fellow and the editor of the journal Race and Class. Dr. Kunani is also the author of The End of Tolerance, Racism in the 21st Century Britain, which was selected as a New Statements Book of the Year in 2007. We are very pleased to have tonight, please give a very warm welcome to Dr. Abun Kunani. Okay, thank you all for coming along. Um, I want to thank New York Public Library for having me. I actually did some of the research for the book um, here in this very building um, using some of the resources here. So it's great to come back and be able to uh, talk about the book that's come out of that research um, with you all um, this evening. So um, I thought I'd begin just by briefly explaining the motivation for the book. Um, Around about um, the time that Obama was elected, um, at the beginning of his first term, one of the things I noticed was that the debate about terrorism um, in the United States was starting to look very different from how it had looked in the Bush years. Right? So whereas in the Bush years we had this very kind of dramatic high profile debate um, where people were talking about things like the Iraq War, um, torture, uh, Abu Ghraib. Um, under Obama, everything went quiet, right? At least for at least for the first um, term, and um, so in a way, what happened was that Obama had kind of normalised um, the war on terror. Even if he hadn't, even if he wasn't using that phrase, the war on terror anymore, the the ideas that had come out of the Bush administration around counterterrorism had kind of just become the new status quo. They didn't need to be discussed with high-profile debates anymore. Um, but my suspicion was, was that the way that we were doing um, domestic counterterrorism in the United States um, was flawed and even discriminatory. And that many of the assumptions being made in how we understand terrorism and what causes it were misguided. Okay? So that's, that was really uh, my starting point for um, the research that I did. So then in 2010, I spent a year traveling around the United States um, 
I spent some time in, in New York, in Minnesota, uh, Michigan, Texas, Virginia, um, Washington, DC, doing interviews with FBI agents who were working on counterterrorism, um, with local police departments, security officials in the Department of Homeland Security, uh, National Security Council in the White House, um, to get a sense of how they understood this counterterrorism work that they were doing, uh, the thinking behind it, and interviews with uh, community activists um, in Muslim communities around the United States. Um, and I interviewed um, a small number of people who who actually uh, been accused, been labelled as Islamic extremists to try and get an understanding of, of um, their stories as well. So I spent a year travelling around doing, that, doing those interviews. I spent some time travelling around England doing similar kinds of interviews over there. And, and the book um, I'm speaking about this evening comes out of, of all of that research. It's mainly about the US story, but there's some sections where you get to hear about uh, similar things in, in England as well. So what I thought I'd do um, as a way into the book this evening is to give you three of the kind of personal stories that I write about, which hopefully between them will give you a feel um, for the kinds of issues that I'm trying to think about, and then um, I'll, I'll try and pull out some of those issues, and then we can get into a Q&A um, uh, after about half an hour or so. Um, so the first story that I want to tell you about is about a guy called Jesse Curtis Morton, whom I interviewed in early 2011, shortly before he was arrested. Jesse Curtis Morton talks about um, not having cable television when he was growing up in the 1980s. So he says, when I was a child, the new wave was MTV, and I didn't have access to it. And I think it's a major reason why I had some level of human consciousness as I grew up. And I could see through the lies and the hypocrisies of my own society from the beginning. So here's someone who, as a teenager, he hates the consumerism that he thinks has brainwashed his fellow students at the working class high school that he's attending. He says, they watch their favourite TV show, and they eat their favourite cereal, and they buy their favourite shoes, and that's what life's about. I think they're sick. I was never part of it. So he leaves home at an early age to escape his abusive family. For a while, he travels with the Grateful Dead, the, uh, the kind of countercultural band who also share this kind of rejection of materialist values. By 2002, he's struggling with drug addiction. He's in Virginia, and he's charged with um, petty larceny and possession of crack cocaine. Within a few years after that, he's converted to Islam, graduated from college, earned a master's degree from Columbia University. He describes his first reading of the Quran as an overwhelming epiphany, and his conversion seems to have given him a new sense of um, focus and discipline. He changes his name to Yunus Abdullah Muhammad, and finds work as a substance abuse counsellor here in New York. He also spends some time in Saudi Arabia. And to his dismay, he, he encounters the same materialism that alienated him from the US society. So he comes to believe that the commercialism that's rampant in America was being imposed around the world. But he also started to think that Islam, uh, which he sees as the religion that saved him from drug addiction, um, would, if, if properly followed, save the world also from Western capitalism. So he has this very offbeat interpretation of Islam um, that he starts to follow that kind of fuses a, a kind of revolutionary anti-globalist politics with a kind of religious conservatism. So very different from um, the way most of American Muslims think about religion. So to take his ideas forward, he helps create an organisation called Revolution Muslim which is launched in December 2007, mainly functions for a website. On there, he posts videos which celebrate the 9-11 attacks. He has discussions of social and economic policies that his group wants to implement. He also attempts to preach his message on the sidewalk outside the Islamic Cultural Center um, on New, New York's Upper East Side. Most of the congregants who are leaving the mosque um, after their prayers basically just ignore his speeches. Then in April 2010, one of the bloggers on, on his site hears about a forthcoming episode of a television series, South Park, in which the Prophet Muhammad is going to be depicted wearing a bear suit. Um, a graphic picture of the murdered Dutch filmmaker Theo van Gogh is then posted on his site, accompanied by a prediction that the 
the writers of South Park will probably suffer a similar fate. Details of the neighbourhood in Colorado where South Park's writers live are added with the suggestion that readers pay a visit. And this posting is soon picked up by the mainstream media uh, and Revolution Muslim, the name of this organisation, uh, enters Google's list of the hundred most searched for phrases. So Abdullah Mohammed is now inundated with calls from journalists, so he decides to issue what he calls a clarification statement. But it doesn't really clarify. It says, we are not trying to directly incite violence. But then um, Osama bin Laden is quoted saying, if there is no check in the freedom of your words, then let your heart be open to the freedom of our actions. Three months later, Abdullah Mohammed quits his job and leaves the United States for Morocco, where he's later arrested and then extradited to the US and charged with conspiracy to solicit the murder of his fellow citizens. Back in the United States, he's held in solitary confinement um, for several months uh, until he agrees to take a, a plea that the government has offered rather than risk a trial. He's sentenced to 11 and a half years in prison. Now, in, in a society like America that usually tolerates threats made online, unless they directly lead to acts of violence, it's a strikingly lengthy sentence. But it's obvious to see why. Abdullah Mohammed embodies the threat that many in the US national security apparatus most fear. A white American who rejects the society in which he was raised and becomes an admirer of its most feared enemy, Osama bin Laden. It's easy to devise psychological theories to explain his journey to radicalism. Could his abusive upbringing have produced a rage that was then projected onto American society as a whole? Was his only way of escaping drug addiction to structure his life according to absolute moral precepts? A Manichaean mindset vulnerable to a fanatical belief in violent struggle between forces of good and evil? Did his childhood experiences give rise to a failure to adjust to reality, a relentless longing for a utopia where his life struggles could be redeemed. And maybe those are all parts of the explanation. But the bigger question is why his ideological journey took the particular form that it did. To answer that, one might start by looking at the way his beliefs mirrored the war on terror's own clash of civilization narrative. So Abdullah Muhammad is basically accepting at face value the official narrative from, from um, at least the Bush administration that radical Islam is an existential threat to an American society that he'd come to, divide, to despise. And he's acting on that basis. So he's merely wrenching the labels of good and evil from the official war on terror discourse and inverting their positions. The second story I want to tell is actually not in the book, but appears in an article in The Nation magazine that has just come out this week, um, and which I've co-authored with uh, Muki Nadja and Emily Kepler, and you can read that online right now on the Nation magazine website. So this is a story about someone called Ayub Abdul Alim, who's um, from Springfield, Massachusetts. He grew up um, in New York City in a family of African American and Puerto Rican heritage. Uh, his um, father was active in the 1960s with the Black Panther Party. His mother was active in the 1960s with the Young Lords, the Puerto Rican kind of uh, youth radical group. Um, he lives in, in Springfield. He's um, active in the community, uh, kind of running a meal service um, and uh, helping people to go and visit people in prison and so forth. Small business owner as well. Um, and over the last few years, Following a, a visit that he made to Saudi Arabia a few years ago, he's getting repeated visits from the FBI um, who are pressuring him to become an informant for them. So um, they're visiting his mosque, they're visiting his home, they're saying, um, uh, you know, we'd, we'd want you to pass on information to us about um, people in the community, their activities and so forth. He, d he says, I'm, I'm not willing to do that. He doesn't want to become a spy on his fellow Muslims in Springfield. Around the same time, um, a, a woman starts getting in touch with him um, who's, who's been introduced through a mutual friend um, who says that um, she's heard about him and, and she's interested in dating him. They start um, meeting up with each other and very soon she's, she's talking about getting married and so they uh, have a religious ceremony and get married. 
they move in together. Um, she has a, a, a small son. He becomes a kind of father figure to the small son. And after they've been living together for about a year, um, Abdul Aleem is walking home uh, from some shops nearby, um, and he's arrested by the Springfield police. Um, and um, he alleges that they placed a gun on him during the search uh, at that point. Two days later, he gets a visit from the same FBI agent who's been um, pressuring him for um, the last couple of years. Um, and this FBI agent says to him, um, okay, well, you've been saying to us for the last two years that you don't want to work as an informant. Um, now is your chance to change your mind um, and, and do the deal of a lifetime. Um, if you say no, you're going to be looking at um, something like 10 years in prison. Abdul Aleem you know, uh, still says, no, that's, that's not what, what I want to do. I'll take my chances with the court on these trumped-up charges. Um, he then finds out that, in fact, his wife was an FBI informant all the way through. Um, and, um, and she testifies in court. Um, to, to that effect. Um, the judge in the trial, which took place in April this year, refuses to allow him to bring evidence of the um, conversations that he's had with the FBI. And so his, his defense that this is an entrapment is, is undermined um, by not being able to bring that evidence. Um, he's then convicted of, uh, he's looking at a six year sentence. Um, in the meantime, the police say that they've found another bag of guns that they allege to be his, and that is now going to court over the next few months, so, so that would maybe add another 10 years if he's convicted of that. Um, so here we have a, a case that kind of illustrates the, the very aggressive tactics that the FBI are currently using to, um, to recruit informants um, to the extent where it seems as if in this case um, they've recruited someone to actually um, uh, arrange a marriage with someone that they consider to be a target. So the third story I want to tell is, is of another um, black Muslim man from Detroit this time called Abdullah Lukman. So he was the imam of a mosque on Detroit's impoverished west side. Every Sunday he and his followers ran a soup kitchen seeking to provide for the basic needs of a local community. With the majority of the people in this neighborhood either unemployed or in low paying jobs, they depend on these kinds of initiatives for their survival. Um, Imam Lukman is, is a familiar face in this, in this landscape. His son, Omar Regan, told me when I interviewed him that um, his father's favorite word was grassroots. Uh, that's how my dad would talk. He's from back in the 60s, he said. So um, Imam Lukman had converted to Islam in the early 1980s after serving in the military and then falling into depression. Um, and as, as his son points out, he comes from a background of, of being involved in, um, uh, in, in groups that are involved in uh, political activism from the 60s. But soon after 9-11, the FBI begins categorizing Abdullah as, quote, a highly placed leader of a nationwide radical fundamentalist Sunni group consisting primarily of African Americans who call on their followers to an offensive jihad rather than a defensive jihad in order to establish a separate sovereign Islamic state within the borders of the United States governed by Sharia law, end quote. So the implication there of that from the FBI is that he shares an ideology with Al-Qaeda. Now there seems, there seems little doubt that Imam Luqman viewed the US government as, a, as an oppressive government and called on his followers to organize protest against it. Like the Black Panther Party, uh, members of this mosque also carried guns. But there's no evidence of any plot to carry out a, a terrorist attack. This is really just small-time hustlers in an impoverished neighborhood <coughs> struggling to, to pay the bills while they denounce America. In 2007, the FBI began a sting operation targeting Imam Lukman's mosque in Detroit. I won't go into the details of the operation, there's a, there's a very detailed account in the book, but essentially the FBI paid very large sums of money to lure um, those around Imam Lukman into helping fence stolen goods so that eventually um, the Imam can be placed at a warehouse in Detroit when the time comes to carry out a raid. And then on the morning of October 28, 2009, uh, 60 law enforcement officers surround this warehouse, including a special operations team that the FBI has flown in from Quantico, Virginia, a SWAT team from the Detroit field office of the FBI, 
uh, officers of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. I don't know why they've turned up. Yeah. Um, and then at a pre-arranged time, um, the, the free informants um, from the Imam's Mosque exit the warehouse. Um, explosives are let off inside the building as a distraction. And a, a dozen federal agents approach the Imam and, and his colleagues and command them to get down and show their hands. Um, accounts of what happened next differ, but most likely the FBI agents suspect that Imam Lukman is holding a gun to his chest. They, they release a dog that's been trained to grab um, at, his, at his arm. As the dog bites at the Imam's face, um, he fires at, at, it, at the dog's chest, which then prompts a return of fire from four of the agents who are positioned nearby. The Imam's killed instantly by semi-automatic rifles from a few feet away. As his body's lying um, on the warehouse floor, the agents handcuff it, uh, even though he's already dead, uh, and the police dog um, is evacuated by helicopter to a hospital for possible life-saving treatment. The Department of Justice exonerate the FBI's handling of the arrest and declare the killing lawful. But there's little doubt that had the government chosen not to infiltrate his mosque and entrap him in a con criminal conspiracy of its own invention, that he would still be alive. Now, the killing of Imam Lukman barely registered in the news media. From one point of view, the manner of his death is hardly different from the dozens of other killings of African Americans each year uh, at the hands of militarized law enforcement agencies. From another perspective, he resembles the thousands of unnamed so-called militants who are killed by drones in Pakistan, Somalia, and Yemen. So whether as a so-called Islamic extremist or as an African American, his death is a perfectly normal occurrence. The criminalization of Imam Lukman is in fact a textbook case of current FBI tactics in the domestic war on terror. Over the last decade, a substantial number of terrorist prosecutions have involved the targeting of people, not for their actions or, or intent uh, to act in any violent way, but for their ideology, for their beliefs. Okay? And then the use of informants and undercover agents acting as agent provocateurs. In all these cases, someone working for the FBI provides not only the plan for um, the alleged terrorist plot, but also the means and opportunity for it. Without the FBI's help in supplying money, weapons, and often a specific plan of attack, the accused would not have had any capability to carry out any plot. And in at least some of these cases, it appears that FBI uh, informants, undercover agents, are able to manipulate vulnerable people with mental health problems or drug addiction problems into conspiring in acts of planned violence that they would otherwise never have been predisposed to. So what's going on here is that to a large degree we're, we're actually fantasizing into existence the very threat of domestic Muslim terrorism that we claim to be fighting. The only radicalization occurring in these cases is the FBI's own. So this concept of radicalization I think is important. I think radic this phrase radicalization which we hear now all the time um, has become the kind of chief lens through which uh, Western societies now view Muslim populations. So on, on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, so-called terrorism experts have advanced what they call theories of radicalization that claim to be able to identify individuals who are not terrorists now, but might be at some later date. Okay? But how do you identify tomorrow's terrorists today? And here I think it's worth thinking about Steven Spielberg's 2002 film Minority Report, in which you have uh, a specialist pre-crime unit, which is imagined um, having these three psychics called, called precogs who can predict the murderers of the future. The pre-crime unit is then able to arrest so-called pre-criminals before they've committed the crimes for which they're convicted. And this is actually a very good allegory for the preventative approach to counter-terrorism that we have within the United States right now. In place of an actual precogs capability like in the film Minority Report. Instead, what we have is security officials turning to academic models that claim a kind of scientific knowledge of a process by which ordinary Muslims are supposed to become terrorists. And these models claim that there's certain behavioral, cultural, and ideological signals that can reveal who's at risk of becoming a terrorist at some point in the future. So in the, F in the FBI's radicalization model, for example, there are four stages that someone's supposed to go through on their way to becoming a terrorist. These are called pre-radicalization, identification, indoctrination, and action. So in the second stage of this four-stage process, things like growing a beard, uh, starting to wear traditional Islamic clothing, 
becoming alienated from one's former life. All of these are listed as indicators that you're on this pathway of radicalization, right? So entirely everyday behaviors that people might have. Um, in, in the third stage of this model, increased activity in a pro-Muslim social group or political cause is listed as an indicator of radicalization, right? At the third stage, which is supposed to be one level away from becoming an active terrorist. So again, First Amendment protected activities like political activism become seen as an indicator that someone's about to become a terrorist. And what's significant here is that all these radicalization models assume that some form of religious ideology is the root cause of terrorism. Okay? And over the last decade, we've seen millions of dollars spent um, by the government trying to prove that there's some link between religious ideology and terrorist violence. Right? When you examine these, um, these studies rigorously, as, which is one of the things I try and do in the book, you find that they actually don't stand up to scrutiny. Um, in the film Minority Report, the precog unit is eventually shut down when its fallibility is revealed. Right? But we've never got to the point where the fallibility of these radicalization models that shape how we do counterterrorism um, that, that, that has never been revealed. So we are still working with these very flawed models that lead to people like Imam Lukman being identified as so-called pre-criminals. Now, in the US, as of 2008, the FBI had a roster of 15,000 paid informants. Okay. Uh, we don't know what proportion of those are working in, um, in, in Muslim communities, but given that half of the FBI's budget is dedicated to counterterrorism, and the FBI understands counterterrorism by and large to mean counter-Muslim terrorism, it's reasonable to assume we have tens of thousands, of, let's say 10,000 or, or somewhere around that number, of uh, paid informants in Muslim communities. What are they doing there? Their job is to ga gather information, not about suspected criminal activity, but about what is understood to be warning signs of radicalization, a very different idea. Then at the New York Police Department, we have a very similar um, policy of, of warrantless surveillance of every aspect of Muslim life. Over 50 mosques um, in New York City and New Jersey have been identified by the NYPD as so-called hotspots, um, in, in, uh, and including restaurants, cafes, bookshops, community organizations, student associations. Um, why have they been identified as hotspots? Well, um, this seems to be not on the basis, again, of any criminal activity, but on the basis of someone having conservative religious opinions um, or expressing political opinions. And we actually have a situation uh, last year where it became obvious that um, the city was actually spending huge amounts of money subsidizing South Asian and Arab restaurants in the city because it was sending so many undercover officers into those restaurants um, to sit and take notes on what people were talking about and so forth. Um, this was stuff that was being done by the so-called demographics unit of the New York Police Department. Um, and it's clear that none of that activity connected to any kind of reasonable suspicion of criminal activity. So there was actually a deposition from one of the leaders of the intelligence division of the New York Police Department who talked about how between 2006 and 2012, all of this surveillance was unable to generate a single criminal lead. Okay. Um, but if you believe in this radicalization idea, then you want to have systematic surveillance and profiling to gather information about political and religious opinions of everyone active in the community. Yeah. So we've had this debate over the last year following Edward Snowden's revelations about how you know, the NSA seems to have a uh, huge amount of data being collected on our digital lives. Um, and it's an important debate that's been going on, but what we've actually lost in that debate is a sense of this other kind of surveillance, it's through informants in the community, undercover agents in the community, right? Which in a way is more pernicious because it's about undermining relationships of trust within a mosque, within a community, right? Um, and what's more, as, um, as government officials and these, and these so-called terrorism experts have repeatedly invoked this concept of radicalization, it's become part of our everyday language, right? And so this has led to um, a situation where there's just this widespread assumption now that the root cause of terrorism lies in some kind of Islamic ideology, right? It now just feels like that's common sense, right? Um, actually, it's not a particularly plausible way of thinking about terrorism, but we just have this def default kind of re reflex that links terrorism to Islamic belief. Um, the evidence to support that is surprisingly weak. Having a belief in, uh, let's call it extremist Islam, or however you want to define that, does not correlate 
with involvement in terrorism. Right? Simple statistical fact. Um, there are many good reasons for objecting to reactionary interpretations of religion, but the idea that religious ideology mechanically causing terrorism is not one of them. Um, and we see these errors being made now in how we understand um, ISIS, the Islamic State. Um, ISIS is a movement of horrific genocidal violence, but we've totally misunderstood what's led to its emergence. We like to think there's something called Islamic extremism, which can, ex can be used to explain everything bad that Muslims do. The reality is that it's politics, not religious ideology, that drives terrorist violence. Right? ISIS is the product not of religion, but of political decisions made by our allies, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and by our own government. It's a product of the legacy that we've created in Iraq. Um, and the, the fact that we're going back to bomb Iraq now shows how deeply we hold on to this myth of um, Islamic extremism and how quickly we've forgotten the lessons of the last Iraq war. Um, since at least 9-11, we've repeatedly had this debate play out in which you have um, someone like Bill Maher, you might have seen this, this um, uh, interview that Bill Maher did um, where he got into an argument with Ben Affleck on his show and Sam Harris, the sort of uh, famous atheist writer, was, was there as well. So Bill Maher and Sam Harris was, were kind of talking about how Islam has this problem of causing terrorism. Uh, ben Affleck said that's racism and this has kind of been circulating a lot on the internet. It's actually a very familiar debate that's been playing out since at least 9-11 where someone says Islam is a violent religion. And then someone else replies and says, actually no, Islam is a religion of peace, it's not inherently violent, but you have this minority who misinterpret Islam in an extremist fashion. Right? So this is the st standard argument. And then each side trades quotations from the Quran right? um, and from the classical Islamic sources, which of course means reading uh, all of those out of context and doesn't really settle anything because we can all trade quotes from the Quran and we don't really get anywhere. Um, and so this goes on and on. <coughs> but the point for me is that both sides in this debate are assuming that if we have a, a, an accurate understanding of Islamic theology, right, that that is fundamentally going to tell us um, whether Islam causes violence or prevents it. Right? So the real meaning of this debate is not actually what each side says, but this kind of hidden assumption that Islamic ideology is the key to understanding why terrorism happens. The argument I make in the book is that Islamic ideology is largely irrelevant in trying to understand the causes of terrorism. And that seems like a weird thing to say because it's become common sense to think otherwise, but we should remember that what we consider to be common sense is always the result of what we've been told to believe by people that we consider to be authorities in this area. And of course, to systematically associate Islamic belief with terrorism in this way feeds Islamophobia. And by Islamophobia, I mean a form of structural racism directed at Muslims. Um, so one, when I was traveling, doing the research for the book, I was in um, a place called Katy, which is a suburb of uh, Houston, Texas. Um, and um, I was writing, I was there because I wanted to interview um, some people in relation to a dispute around the opening of a mosque that was going on over there. Um, but I was in a restaurant, and on the wall of this restaurant, uh, there's a poster hanging where you can see um, one of those old um, famous photographs from maybe the 1920s of a lynching, right? Um, body hanging from a tree, um, group of people in the front looking quite pleased with themselves. Um, but where you'd normally see a black face uh, in this restaurant, the poster had superimposed um, a, a kind of stereotypical image of an Arab. Um, and then the caption underneath was, um, let's play cowboys and Iranians. Okay? So it's a, it's a kind of shocking image, um, but it's also a very revealing image to me, right? Because actually what this poster does is encapsulate um, how Islamophobia is a continuation and a kind of reworking of the longer histories of racism in the United States. Right? So within that, um, within that poster you have you know, a kind of implicit reference with a reference to cowboys and, and Indians, you have a kind of implicit reference to the genocide of, of indigenous people in, in the Americas. Um, and then you have the, the reference to Jim Crow segregation in the South and lynching and so forth. And then as it were the third layer on top of that is uh, anti-Muslim racism. Obviously, whoever's doing this post doesn't understand that Arabs and Iranians are different people, but that all kind of merges into one. Um, 
So it's a, I think it's important to understand that it comes out of its longer history. And also is analogous in important ways to anti-Semitism. Right? So one of the things that anti-Semitism does in the late 19th century is it turns a whole load of people who are considered to share a religion into people who are seen as having the same race. Right? That's what anti-Semitism does in how it understands who Jews are in the late 19th century. Right? And one of the key ways in which it does that is to talk about a Jewish conspiracy theory. Right? Um, the idea that there's a secret cabal of Jews who are manipulating world events for their own gain. So behind what appears to be the real uh, world events taking place, there's a, there's a, you know, a secret Jewish conspiracy. Right? What's interesting about anti-Semitism compared to other forms of racism is that it therefore turns Jews into not just some kind of sub-human class of people which it sees them as, but also a super powerful people, right? So they're both above and below everyone else, right? It's exactly the same structure that we have now with Islamophobia. Islamophobia also now has, right at the center of it, a conspiracy theory, right? Obama is a secret Muslim controlling the world, infiltrated Sharia law through the White House, right? Or in Europe, the, the European Union, the conspiracy is that the European Union is a secret conspiracy by Arabs to, to colonize Europe, right? Um, all of these conspiracies run through Islamophobic discourse, and they do the same thing that anti-Semitism historically did. They say Muslims are both this kind of backward underclass of people, but also this super powerful hidden force in the world, right? Um, which doesn't mean that the future for Muslims in America or in Europe is going to resemble the future that Jews had in the, in the 20th century. But it's very striking to me that the, the, the structure of this racism works very, very similar way. Now, to say all that um, does not imply that to criticize Islamic belief is somehow racist, right? That would obviously be wrong. What it does mean is that um, we need to pay attention to opposing the kind of social and political processes by which uh, Islamophobia is acted out in violent attacks on the street, which we've seen increasing over the last few years in the US, um, or the way it's institutionalized in state pra government practices like profiling, civil rights abuses, um, drone strikes, etc. When we look at the official way in which terrorism is understood, what it leaves out is the role of the government foreign policy in fostering political contexts within which terrorism becomes more likely. Right? So this idea that, that we can blame terrorism on Islamic belief is convenient because it allows us to talk about religion and not talk about politics, including the politics of our own government. Right? Religion may provide the kind of vocabulary by which some terrorists articulate their propaganda, but it's politics that's the underlying cause. So you think about a group like Hamas. Hamas uses religious language to, to legitimize its um, violence, right? It also uses religious language to legitimize its ceasefires. So it's not the religious part of it that's driving its decision to use violence or not in a particular context. What's driving that decision is that it's its assessment of the political context it's in, Israel's occupation, etc. right? And this is consistent with the whole history of terrorism. Whenever you think about, uh, if you look at all the kind of uh, examples of terrorism over the last 150, 200 years or so, you find this repeating pattern. Terrorism is driven by political contexts, particularly contexts of political injustice, right? So uh, the, the first kind of um, really modern uh, terrorist movement is the anarchist bombers and assassins of the late 19th century, right? They come out of a context of the violent suppression of the Paris Commune in 1871 when this kind of working class movement takes over Paris um, and then tens of thousands of them are killed by the army um, to suppress this insurrection. The, some of the survivors then say, okay, now it's legitimate for us to use dynamite. Okay? It's that context that creates that decision making. Um, same in Northern Ireland, right? The, um, you have in Northern Ireland in the late 1960s a, a civil rights movement from the uh, nationalist community, the Catholic community, right? That civil rights movement faces uh, violent suppression by the British Army. That then creates a context in which um, the provisional Irish Republican Army emerges as, as an armed group, um, and you have the uh, violent conflict that unfolds um, over, over subsequent decades. Look at South Africa. In South Africa, uh, you have in 1960 the Sharpeville massacre, school students, 
protesting that their classes have to be taught in Afrikaans, which is not their language. They're shot by the apartheid state to that point that the African National Congress decides now is the time to embark on a campaign of bombing and sabotage. Okay? Um, so we have this repeating pattern. Then let's look at what happens in Britain um, in the last decade or so. Right? The number of people convicted of terrorism-related crimes in Britain more than doubles between 2003 and 2006, before then falling back to the level it was at before by 2009. Right? So what explains this dramatic surge in terrorism between 2003 and 2006? Well, the fact that Britain decides to join the war in Iraq in 2003 is not the whole story, but it's a major factor in why that happens. Right? Um, you, know, you have, in 2003, millions of people on the, on the streets in London protesting against the imminent war, expecting that in a democracy that number of people um, protesting and demonstrating should lead to a change in government policy. That doesn't happen from the Tony Blair government. And so you have, for then, for a very small number of people, a feeling that, okay, well now it's legitimate for me to carry out acts of violence against my fellow citizens. Right? Obviously, completely flawed logic of collective punishment of um, human rights, violations against other people. But that is the process that we need to understand. All right? What's changed for those people who, who are doing that is not that somehow their religious ideology has changed from moderate Islam to extremist Islam. What's changed for them is that they've been exposed to the news from Iraq of hundreds of thousands of people dying. Okay. So, um, for me, um, we're in a situation where um, we're in a cycle of violence, right? But we only see the violence of others. I think this is the fundamental point here. The, um, the Irish poet, Brendan Behan, once said it's easy, when he was asked, how do, you, how do you know who the terrorist is? He said, it's easy, he's the guy with the small bomb, right? In other words, the guy with the big bomb is the government who never gets called a terrorist, right? So he was highlighting this peculiar feature of the word terrorist that it arbitrarily separates um, the violence of what are called non-state actors, groups who are not governments, from this wider background of, of the violence that governments carry out. And that violence is always seen as normal, necessary, rational. Right? Um, but in actual fact, both those forms of violence feed each other in this cycle of war and murder. Uh, words like terrorism, extremism, radicalization encourage us to see only half of that equation. Um, and for me, you know, one of the people who understands this point most deeply is Martin Luther King. Um, when he's speaking at the Riverside Church in 1967, um, and he's talking about how he's gone to um, black neighborhoods across the United States to try and persuade young black people not to use violence um, to express their frustration at American racism. Right? And he says, I tried to say to them, um, to, uh, to, I tried to say to these angry young men um, not to use violence, right? But he said um, that the more he did that, the more hypocritical he felt. Because, he said, I knew um, that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government, right? He's talking about at the time of the Vietnam War. Right? So violence is not just about uh, the angry young men, it's also about what governments do, and they both feed each other. Right? And that's a point that remains as valid today, in the era of the ongoing war on terror, with its drone strikes, with its bombing, uh, and with the, the way in which we entrap people within the United States itself, um, and, and put people in prison for decades for the, for the opinions that they hold. Thank you, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you.